China's first ever Golden Globe winner is now facing backlash from her home country. It's because of her criticism of China from back in 2013. The Chinese Communist Party head takes military tension with Taiwan to a new level, and a top U.S. military officer warns of a potential invasion. China's new AI can recognize you even if you're wearing a mask. The software won a Shanghai-based company first place in a global tech competition. A young man suffers 14 years in jail for leaking details about CCP head Xi Jinping's daughter. The young man faced torture and was forced to confess. And China's largest offshore oil producer delists from the New York Stock Exchange. It's in compliance with a Trump-era order banning U.S. investment in companies tied to China's military. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Before we start, our videos are being censored. Some of you say you've been unsubscribed. Others aren't getting notified when we release new videos. We're also being demonetized. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD by subscribing to our newsletter. Sign up at newsletter.ntd.com, where you can access all of our content. The Chinese regime is leading a statewide boycott of the award-winning film Nomadland. This because of a comment from its Chinese director back in 2013. NTD's Don Ma has more. An award-winning Chinese director is facing backlash in communist China. That's for a comment she made back in 2013, critical of the regime. Chloe Zhao is the director of the 2021 American movie Nomadland. Last Sunday, she made history at the Golden Globe Awards with her new film. Zhao became the first Asian woman ever to win the title of Best Director. Zhao's win was initially celebrated in China. On Chinese social media platform Weibo, her win trended with hundreds of millions of views. Chinese state media even crowned her as the pride of China. Chinese film authorities approved the film for a domestic release in April. But Chinese internet users soon dug up an interview Zhao had in 2013. Zhao told Filmmaker magazine at the time that China is, quote, a place where there are lies everywhere. A lot of info I received when I was young was not true. I went to England suddenly and relearned my history. When she was 15, her parents sent her to study in the UK. There, she studied political science in college. And that's where she learned the truth about China. Now the film's release is up in the air. Major Chinese online box office apps have removed the movie's release date from their platforms. And the hashtag Nomadland is no longer searchable on Chinese social media platform Weibo. Censorship in China could be a significant issue for another film Zhao would direct. It's a big-budget superhero movie called The Eternals by Disney's Marvel Studios. The previous Marvel movie, Avengers Endgame, had huge earnings in the Chinese market. It earned more than half a billion dollars there. But now, Zhao's profit of her upcoming film is put into question. Reporting by Don Ma, NTD News. Now let's turn to Taiwan and a warning about the island's long-term safety. A top U.S. military officer says China could invade Taiwan in the coming years. That's as Beijing works to build a military as powerful as the United States by 2050. Taiwan is clearly um, one of their ambitions before that. And I think the threat is manifest during this decade, in fact, in the next six years. His concerns come as Chinese Communist Party head Xi Jinping works to bolster his military. Speaking in front of top military officials on Tuesday, Xi warned of instability and uncertainty in China's national security. He also urged troops to improve combat readiness. Although Xi didn't mention Taiwan in his speech, the Chinese regime has been upping tensions in the Taiwan Strait. Chinese military jets have been spotted soaring through Taiwan's air defense zone in recent months. Top Chinese diplomats have also advised the Biden administration against crossing what it has deemed red lines, including the Taiwan issue. Taiwan has never officially declared independence from mainland China, but it's become a de facto independent nation state with its own democratic government and military. The Chinese regime still claims Taiwan is part of its territory, and has been threatening to bring the island back under Beijing's control by force if needed. The U.S. does not have formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan, but under U.S. law, Washington must sell arms to Taiwan to help it defend against attacks. Washington never made clear whether it would defend Taiwan if China did invade, but the island remains crucial to America's national security. 
That's because Taiwan sits on a critical line of defense for the U.S. It's part of a chain of islands ranging from Japan all the way to Malaysia. The chain makes it hard for Beijing to launch submarine-based nuclear missiles toward the U.S. But a break in that chain could leave the U.S. vulnerable. But that's not all China's military has been up to. Taiwanese media reports say China is expanding two military airports. Satellite photos show the two airports now have more runways and ramps. But what really makes them crucial are their locations. Both airports are located in China's southeastern Fujian province, not far from Taiwan. A Taiwanese defense expert says China's fighter jets taking off there could reach Taipei in about seven minutes. China's Mask On facial recognition project just took home the gold in a global tech competition. Nearly 200 companies from around the world participated. The contest was sponsored by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, an agency under the U.S. Commerce Department. Shanghai-based tech company Export AI scored best in show for its milestone in facial recognition. The company's new mask-on system can identify faces even when covered by masks, no matter the material or color. The company has kept a focus on AI development for the past decade. The company also plans to release the world's biggest facial database and a series of benchmarks based on that data. Facial recognition is widely used in China's Xinjiang region as a method for identifying and suppressing the Uyghur ethnic minority. A 21-year-old young man in China is believed to be tortured by police. His alleged crime? Sharing information about Xi Jinping's daughter. The young man's mother says Chinese police are torturing him to get a confession. And Didi's Hong Ning has more. 21-year-old Niu Tong Yu is a self-taught coder in China. At the end of 2020, Chinese authorities sentenced him to 14 years in prison for what they call picking quarrels and stirring up trouble and violating others' privacy. Neil received the harshest punishment among the 24 people arrested with him. All 24 of them were involved in the leaking of Chinese Communist Party head Xi Jinping's daughter's personal information. They had administrative access to a wiki-based forum. They did not leak the information directly, but only shared links to some foreign websites. These websites show the ID number and ID photo of Xi's daughter. This happened in 2019. Police detained Niu in August 2019. Niu's mother says Niu refused to plead guilty, so police tortured him to get a confession. He was hung up and splashed with cold water when he collapsed from the beating. Then they went on beating him. He was not allowed to eat or sleep and he was injected with saline. Worse still, a policeman surnamed Chen stripped my son naked, insulted him personally, and used some obscene language on him. In a handwritten note recently made public, Niu said police forced him to confess to crimes he did not commit. For this, they made him write his alleged crimes on several hundred sheets of paper. When he failed to finish writing within the required time frame, he was beaten, deprived of sleep. He wrote that within 40 days in December 2019 and January 2020, he slept no more than 30 hours combined. Niu's lawyers told his mother after visiting Niu that the officers used a lighter to burn his private parts, and a police officer also recorded the torture sessions and created a folder for them in order to insult Niu. They did all this to force a confession from him. The lawyer told me he saw cigarette burns on my son's arm, and they injected some unknown substances into his feet that caused pus. My son told the lawyer not to tell me. He did not want me to be scared. This is what the first lawyer told me. Neo's mother had to change lawyers six times to defend her son. The first five dropped the case after authorities threatened to revoke their licenses. Neo's mother also received death threats for speaking out for her son. Neo's mother also says she is suffering from worsening eyesight and heart issues. This is because she is anxious about her son. Despite the challenges, she says she will stay strong and tell the world what the Chinese police have done to her son. She says, may heaven help me so that I can live to the day when I can see my son again. Hong Ning, NTD News. The Chinese regime is actively testing its own digital currency. It wants to compete with the world's most popular digital currency, Bitcoin. But can it prevail in the battle? NTD's Becky Jo has the latest. It's incredible that one Bitcoin is worth over $50,000, and it's attracting competitors such as the Chinese yuan into the digital currency market. 
but the Chinese regime's agenda may be above and beyond digital currency. Chinese authorities are testing digital yuan in multiple cities such as Shanghai and Beijing. They call it e-yuan and claim it will simplify payment transactions. It's not freely exchangeable with U.S. dollars. And also government controls the exchange rate. So for most Americans, they probably won't feel anything. Both e-yuan and Bitcoin are digital currencies, but they're different. Bitcoin was not issued by any government entities. It was issued by a group that the, we don't even know the, who they are. That's the, the true encrypted digital currency. EUN is similar to Apple Pay in the sense that users place their phones next to a device to complete each payment. But it's also unique. Users can withdraw EUN via ATM machines onto their phones to make purchases. According to Chinese state-run media, users can still transfer money without internet connection. How is the, the Chinese system you know, connected with the U.S. system? That's a problem that U.S. companies may face, like importers, exporters. For those American companies that do business with China, they have to figure out a way to deal with EUN. But the implications of EUN go beyond trade. The CCP could use its digital currency to evade U.S. sanctions and support other internationally sanctioned regimes. The Washington Post says the CCP used Chinese yuan to buy Venezuela's digital currency Petro when Petro was created against U.S. sanctions in 2018. And Beijing could also suspend the digital wallets of human rights activists with no difficulties. For people like the dissidents, people that the Chinese government doesn't uh, like, underground Christians, Falun Gong practitioners, uh, Tibetan monks, Quakers, if they want to punish them, they can close their account. The Chinese regime is reportedly also trying to expand EUN to Hong Kong and use it at the Winter Olympic Games in Beijing next year. Reporting by Becky Joe, NTD News. China is trying to break its reliance on foreign countries, but not just in the tech sector. Agriculture is also presenting a problem, with much of the country's seeds imported from elsewhere. NTD's Wen Hui has more. China's agriculture industry is facing a major problem, over-reliance on foreign seeds. The Chinese regime's media mouthpiece Xinhua News Agency published an article Tuesday, March 9, addressing it. The article called Crop Seeds the Microchips of Agriculture, a reference to China's efforts to break away from its reliance on American technology. In some regions of China, foreign seeds make up over 80 or even 100 percent of seeds planted for some crop varieties. Kusha County in Heilongjiang province has been growing potatoes for over a century. It's even been nicknamed China's home of potatoes. But its potato crops are grown from imported tubers. It's the same for corn, too. U.S.-based company Pioneer, owned by the DuPont Group, supplies the hybrid corn seeds used in northern and northeastern China for over a decade. It makes up around 60 percent of the country's corn production. China's chili pepper, onion, carrot, tomato, and broccoli crops also largely rely on imported seeds. The Chinese media article also notes another side of the problem, severe seed degradation for domestic corn. The country's agricultural technology lags far behind a number of developed countries. Vice President of the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences, Wan Jianmin, says China's breeding tech is somewhere between a crossbreeding and gene editing, whereas developed countries have already combined biotech, AI, and big data. Its ability to evaluate seed quality has also been brought into question. Even though the country maintains the world's second largest collection of seed resources, only 15,000 of them are accurately identified. That's out of a whopping 50 million total. Likewise, researchers have found major shortcomings in China's ability to protect seed resources. In a recent five-year survey from across six provinces, a study found over 70 percent of local crop varieties have disappeared. The article by Chinese media painted the situation as a high-tech battle, warning against major supply chain problems if other countries were to cut seed exports to China. China's largest offshore oil producer has been delisted from the New York Stock Exchange. CNOC is China's state-owned oil company. It listed on the NYSE in 2001. The removal aims to comply with former President Trump's executive order from last November. The order banned U.S. investment in companies tied to China's military. The specifics of CNOC's blacklist haven't been announced. But the company has been a center of oil drilling in the South China Sea, despite standoffs over the territory between Beijing and its neighbors. Networking website LinkedIn says it will respect China's laws as it tries to maintain standing in the Chinese market. 
The statement follows an accusation from its parent company Microsoft, blaming Chinese hackers for a recent cyber attack on its email servers. LinkedIn has paused new member signups for its service in China, but that's just temporary, while it reviews its compliance with Chinese law. The firm said on Tuesday that it respects the laws that apply to the company and will adhere to regulations. A professor at Hong Kong University shed light on the sign-up pause. He told news outlet AFP it could be to ensure that all users' profiles in China are registered under real names. He explained that Chinese law requires web-based businesses to allow real names only for digital accounts. The Chinese regime has a long history of collecting online personal data of its citizens. LinkedIn has previously faced criticism in China for censoring information deemed inappropriate by the state and for closing user accounts made by Chinese dissidents, something it later called a mistake. The site currently has more than 50 million users in China. It entered the Chinese market in 2014, agreeing to China's strict censorship laws. A bipartisan group in Congress is calling on President Biden to defend Hong Kong's basic freedoms. NTD's Melina Weiskup has more details on the CCP's push for more control and U.S. Congress members' response to it. China's rubber stamp parliament is set to vote this week on a new set of rules to reform Hong Kong's election laws. It would add 300 members to the election committee responsible for choosing Hong Kong's chief executive. And if most of them are pro-Beijing as expected, it would make it harder for the CCP's political opposition to hold office. Beijing officials say the new rules will ensure the city is run by, quote, Chinese patriots. On Tuesday, U.S. lawmakers who oversee congressional China policy denounced the effort. Writing in a joint statement, these revisions will only continue to advance Beijing's ever-tightening grip on Hong Kongers' autonomy, basic freedoms, and fundamental human rights. They say Beijing is again violating its international commitments under the One Country, Two Systems Agreement. The Congress members say they will continue to speak up to protect the freedom of Hong Kongers, and they're calling on Biden to stand up too. The Congress members point out that they've passed legislation giving the executive branch new tools to support the people of Hong Kong, and they're urging the Biden administration to use those tools. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. One Hong Kong lawmaker is pushing for policy change. He's advocating for Beijing's proposed overhaul of the city's electoral system, saying it would help prevent a dictatorship of the majority. The lawmaker, Martin Liao, sits on both China's and Hong Kong's legislature. His remarks come as Beijing is looking to renovate Hong Kong's electoral system. That's so pro-Beijing members would be in charge. Part of Beijing's plan is to increase the members of Hong Kong's legislative council. Right now, there are 70 seats. Beijing wants to expand it to 90. Martin Liao claims many people in Hong Kong are politically immature and that the overhaul would prevent what he called a majority dictatorship, meaning that the majority would make all ruling decisions. A new episode in the tensions between China and the UK. Beijing summoned UK's ambassador to China on Tuesday. This comes after she posted an article defending media freedom. Carolyn Wilson posted an article last week on WeChat, a Chinese social media platform. She explained why foreign media's criticism of the Chinese regime did not mean the journalists responsible hate China. But the Chinese regime said her article was, quote, inappropriate. It said it only opposes those journalists who make up so-called fake news. In response, Wilson wrote on Twitter, I stand by my article. No doubt the outgoing Chinese ambassador to the UK stands by the 170 plus pieces he was free to place in mainstream British media. Last month, Beijing banned BBC World News following reports alleging abuses in Xinjiang province. This comes after UK's media regulator Ofcom barred Chinese state broadcaster CGTN. Ofcom said the channel was controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, which goes against UK regulations. An NGO director in the UK says there's a growing push to scrutinize Chinese state-run broadcaster CGTN more closely. This comes after recent decisions by TV regulators in the UK and France. NTD's Joy Do Good has more. UK broadcast regulator Ofcom on Monday imposed fines on Chinese state-run news channel CGTN, £125,000 for its partial coverage of Hong Kong protests 
and a £100,000 fine for airing a forced confession of British national Peter Humphrey. Humphrey has mixed feelings about the rulings. I'm very pleased to see all of these um, disciplinary legal rulings against PGTN. I'm disappointed that the fines are so small. He says fines should be in the millions, since it involves severe and brutal human rights crimes. £100,000 behind something like CGTN is just like spitting in the wind, because CGTN is funded by the very deep and very dirty and very bloody pockets of the Chinese Communist Party. Last week, a French regulator approved CGTN's licence to broadcast in France and by extension in Europe. This comes after Ofcom revoked its UK licence in February following complaints filed by human rights NGO Safeguard Defenders. Its director says he's not concerned about the French decision. The CSA, as they are called, made it very clear, and this is incredibly unusual, that they will be paying close attention to CGTN and what they broadcast. Uh, so I think it's actually a positive development because it puts more pressure on CGTN. He says it has always been their goal to get TV regulators to better scrutinise Chinese state-owned broadcasters. Peter Darlin is also a victim of a forced confession that was broadcast on Chinese state TV. He says he sees a growing push against Chinese Communist Party or CCP media. And not just in Europe. An Australian broadcaster recently suspended CGTN after receiving a letter from Safeguard Defenders. He says regulations cannot properly deal with the current media landscape anymore. It's, it's a patchwork, really, and there's a lot of ways around these regulations. So for sure, I think, I mean, we're getting to the point where we, we need a reckoning uh, with a more comprehensive overview of how do we combat disinformation, direct lies, biases. He says Safeguard Defenders has some quite exciting developments in the pipeline. Joy Dugid, NTD News. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.